Hey everyone, welcome to this full paper walkthrough for Enga 2019 section 1A. 20 questions, approximately 25 minutes, so you've got to work pretty fast. Let's get into it. So question one, pretty straightforward maths question, as long as you spot that you're working with the difference of two squares. So a squared minus b squared factorizes into a plus b times a minus b. And when you plug in the numbers, you should get your answer as f. Question two is our first physics question of the paper. And you know the current in the circuit is 8 milliamps. So you can use the graph to work out the corresponding voltage across the diode. You know the diode is in series with the resistor. So if there's 1.2 volts across the diode, there must be 4.8 volts across the resistor. And you also have the current in the circuit. It's once again a series circuit. So current is the same everywhere. And that's 8 milliamps. So you can work out the resistance of the resistor by dividing 4.8 volts across the resistor by 8 milliamps through it, which gives you 600 ohms. Question 3 is a pretty straightforward rearrangement question. The only point to bear in mind here is when you take the square root, it could give you either the positive or the negative square root. So it's important to have the plus minus sign in your answer. So for question four, it's important to know your properties of EM waves. So all EM waves travel at the same speed, which automatically rules out all answers from E to H. And from the relationship V is equal to F lambda, if V is constant, then F is inversely proportional to lambda. So the ratio of frequencies is equal to one over the ratio of wavelengths, which means the answers can only be A or B. At this point, you can see that the wavelength of P is greater than the wavelength of Q. And this could only be possible if P is a microwave and Q is an X-ray, so the answer is A. For question 5, you want to form a proportionality relationship. So you know that the resistance is proportional to the square of the speed. So R is proportional to V squared. And this can be written as R is equal to some constant of proportionality K times the speed squared. If the speed increases by 20%, um, V is now 1.2 times what it originally was. So when you square 1.2, you get 1.44. So the new resistance is 44% higher than the original one. So question six is actually a pretty tricky PV equals constant question. So you can use that equation to work out the pressure when the cylinder is submerged below the water. And this gives you a new pressure of 500,000 pascals. But when you're converting this to a height, you need to remember that the equation for liquid pressure is delta P is rho G delta H. So the change in pressure is actually 400,000 pascals because you still have the 100,000 pascals from atmospheric pressure. And this gives you a delta H change in height of 40 meters, which is A. Question seven is a straightforward simultaneous equations question. So you've been given two points and what you do is you substitute the X and Y values of those two points into the equation of the curve to get two equations in terms of P and Q. You could then solve those equations simultaneously to get separate values for P and Q and then work out Q minus P. So for this question, whenever you're trying to work out power produced as heat in the cables, you're always looking to calculate the value of I squared R. So you can start off with the two relationships, VP over VS equals NP over NS, and conservation of power, VPIP equals VSIS, to work out the current in the secondary coil, which is 0.2 amps. You then square this current and multiply by the secondary resistance, 1500 ohms, to give you a value of 60 watts for the power. Question nine is a pretty straightforward simplification question. Um, the best way to go about these sorts of problems is just to do as much practice as possible with them and try and get faster at solving them. So what you want to do for this question is factorize the denominator, cancel out the common factors, and then basically rearrange until you get it into the simplest form possible, which is D. Question 10 is pretty much intuition. So for thermal energy to be conducted along the bar at the lowest rate, you want to maximize your distance between the beakers L. You want to reduce the diameter D over which thermal energy is transferred. And you also want to minimize your difference in temperature between the two beakers. So the constraint on L, the distance between the beakers, automatically rules out 
A to D, and you want D to be as small as you want the diameter D to be as small as possible, which means you're only left with E and F. And if you calculate the difference in temperatures between the beakers for both E and F, you end up with your answer as F. So the volume of a sphere is 4 over 3 pi r cubed. And if the radius is reduced by 25%, so the radius becomes 3 quarters of its original value, the volume would be 3 quarters cubed of its original value. So it would be 27 over 64 of its original value. And when you multiply that by its current volume of 192 centimeter cubed, you get a new volume of 81, which is B. So question 12 relies on you knowing how both alpha and beta minus decay affects both the mass number and the atomic number. So for alpha decay, A decreases by 4, Z decreases by 2, and for beta minus, A stays the same and Z increases by 1. The question also says that there are more alpha particles emitted than beta particles, and there are 7 particles emitted in total. So there must be at least 4 alpha particles. So the atomic number must decrease by at least 16, which rules out A and B. From then on, it's pretty much trial and error. So you try the values for C, D, and E. And in this case, it works with C. So the answer is C. Question 13 is a pretty standard Pythagoras question. So you want to use Pythagoras theorem a squared plus b squared equals c squared to work out the value of x. And once you've obtained the value of x, noting that you get two values of x, one is positive, one is negative. Obviously, because it's a length, it can only take the positive value. Um, when you have the value of x, you can plug it in to work out the length of the base and the height, and the area of the triangle is half times base times height. Question 14 is pretty much a multi-step kinematics question. So you're given the change in kinetic energy, and using the mass, you can work out the original velocity, which is 4 meters per second, and then the final velocity after the action of the force, which is 10 meters per second. You're also given the time over which that velocity changes. So you can use A is equal to V minus U over T to work out the acceleration, and then Newton's second law, F is equal to MA, to work out the value of the force. Question 15 relies on you knowing the very specific fact that the area of a rhombus is equal to the product of the diagonals over 2. So you take the two diagonals, PR and QS, and multiply them together to set up a quadratic equation in terms of x. Um, and when you factorize this, it gives you 6x minus 2 times x minus 3 equals 0. So the two values of x are 3 and a third. Using 3, you get the value of PR as 11. And using a third, you get the value of PR as 3. And the difference between these two values, which is what you're asked to work out, is 8. So what you want to do for question 16 is, you know all five resistors have the same resistance. So you can set that equal to R. And using that value of R, you can work out the resistance of the parallel part of the circuit. So you have R on the bottom, uh, sorry, R on the top, 2R on the bottom. And that comes out to 2R over 3 altogether. You know there's 1 volt across the resistor on the bottom branch. So the resistor next to it also must have 1 volt across it because they're identical. So the resistance across the parallel bit is 2 volts in total. And those 2 volts are across a resistance of 2R over 3. Now using the potential divider equation, you know that 2R over 3 over the total resistance, which is 2R over 3 plus 2R either side of the parallel bit, times the voltage across the battery gives you the value of 2 volts. And you can then rearrange that equation to work out the voltage across the battery as 8 volts, which is E. For question 17, you kind of have to think outside the box a bit. So you know from Pythagoras' theorem that PR equals RT, which is 5 centimeters. And then you can set the angle theta is equal to angle QRP and sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse, which is 3 over 5. You can then mark a point X directly below Q and you can use the relationship that XR, the distance XR, is equal to 4 cos theta. 
if sine theta is 3 over 5 um, by sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals 1, you know that cos theta is 4 over 5 because the angle is acute. And 4 times 4 over 5 is 16 over 5. The distance QS is 2 times the distance XR. So the distance QS is 32 over 5, which is 6.4. Question 18 is a pretty standard density question. So you, you've been given a cuboid shaped block with a cylindrical hole in the middle and you're asked to work out the mass of the block. So you can work out the volume of the cuboid altogether by the cross-sectional area times the length. And similar sort of thing for the cylinder, taking pi as 22 over 7. You can then subtract the volume of the cylinder from the volume of the cuboid to give you the volume of material that you have and then multiply that by the density to give the overall mass. In question 19, you're asked to work out the vertical height h of a solid square base pyramid, and you're also told that the volume of the pyramid is equal to the total surface area. So the volume is, they've provided you with an equation, so a third times 12 squared, which is the area of the base, times h, and the total surface area is the area of the base, 12 squared, plus four times the area of each triangular face. And it helps to get the area of the triangular face in terms of h using Pythagoras' theorem, because L squared from the triangle above is equal to h squared plus six squared. You can then rearrange this to get a quadratic equation in terms of h, which you can solve to give h as eight. So last question of the paper, question 20. And for these types of isotope decay questions, it helps to have a table where you can write down the quantities of x and y at relevant timestamps. So you know that at t is equal to zero, x and y are in equal proportions. And after one half-life, t equals three, x goes down to half of its original value, so x is down to half. And the half of x that has decayed becomes y. So y is now three over two. After another half-life, x halves again, goes to a quarter. And that quarter of x that has decayed big turns into y. So y goes from 3 over 2 to 7 over 4. So the ratio of x to y is 1 over 4 is to 7 over 4, which is 1 is to 7. Thank you everyone, hope you found it useful. And for more ESAT practice and preparation resources, make sure to check out the ESAT hub on our website. Link will be in the description.